Welcome by the numbers. Uh, Tyson Banker, your host with you here, Vintage Clear Media. Really excited for the show today. Uh, finally get to dive into the vintage uh, cards that, you know, I've had vintage cards spotlight on my show and been highlighting older cards and probably wrongfully calling some of the cards vintage that really aren't. And I'm excited to bring on the guy that uh, Ty had a great show with, uh, Ryland Nolan. Had to bring him on because of his expertise in vintage. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ryan. And uh, why don't you tell us about your card show quest, since that's been all the topic and the headline of Ty's show was 47 card shows. How are we doing on that? Yeah, so I finished card show number 50 last weekend in Philly. This weekend is Collector's Con in Tampa, which is 51, and then the following weekend's in Alabama, which is 52. So be knocking out the 52 shows, taking like a few, a few weeks off, relaxing a little bit because it's been hectic all year. And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun ride with that. So when we say quantitative, doing 52 shows, that obviously sounds insane. But <laughs> then when you think about actually doing it, has it taken away the love of it all for you of going to the card shows? Or is it still just pretty like is it awesome every time you go? Are you enjoying it? Or is it getting more like work? <laughs> I'll be honest, it's been really enjoyable throughout the year. Last weekend kind of felt like work a little bit because I had to get up at 3 a.m. to catch a flight, and I came home at about two o'clock and at the night so it was pretty much 23 hours up straight just going traveling to philly flying back and then that sunday throughout this entire week i've been working my book nonstop. Um, i have work full time so i'll work from eight to five and then i'll work on the book when i get home all the way till like one or two in the morning so i'm a little little exhausted from everything but i'm trying to finish and grind through it just kind of share with the listeners a little bit about your book real quick yeah, so I've been working the last 11 months on a book on how to spot fake cards. So it's about 180 pages. The first 70, 80 pages talks about different concepts on how people can identify fake cards, all the different signs of alterations and things along the lines with that. And then the next 100 or so pages is based around the top 50 fake cards in the hobby, where I break down pictures I found on different marketplaces or at card shows, along with a picture of a real one and have bullet points talking about what makes a card real what makes it fake so that way you can use it as a guide um so i have a kindle version which i've been working on all night today just making sure it formats with that and i have the other version as well i'm opening up pre-orders probably early next week or i don't know when this is going to be fully on but it might be out already and also going to have copies on amazon as well the pre-orders are going to be signed copies on my website a little bit cheaper than what amazon is well, that's awesome. I definitely will be checking out the Kindle version. or right, I'll get a version of some kind. That seems like a really interesting book for sure. I think one thing I hate about fake cards is that sometimes I feel bad for the guys that are trying to sell a card when they don't know it's fake. Like they picked it up and then they're the ones that look like the scapegoats and that's, they, oh, so feel so bad for. <laughs> I know. And that happens a lot with the vintage cards. I see a lot more vintage fake cards than anything else. But recently there's been a change towards kind of like the PMGs and the more modern side of things as well. I mean, football wise, the, the, one of the most fake cards out there, obviously the 2000 Bowman uh, Brady. What I find interesting with that card is I've seen multiple iterations of the fake now over this past year. The first fake I saw at shows and online didn't have any foil on it. The face and colors and everything was washed on the card. So it's pretty obvious fake to see. Like obviously if there's no foil, it's it's not the Brady rookie. The Bowman has the foil and at the bottom there's foil saying Tom Brady. Well, on the new iterations of the fake, now there's foil. The colors are still washed. Um, but that's the issue with that. And what makes it scary is people are putting the fake foil ones in fake PSA slabs. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing about PSA being somewhat basic of a slab. It's pretty easy to mimic, which is a little bit scary too. And even some companies have come out and they almost look identical and you're like, oh, that's not a PSA slab. So it's yeah. definitely, definitely crazy, but definitely a great book. So I hope all the listeners check that out. Uh, good luck with that, Ryan. That's quite the accomplishment to write a book, sir. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> So I thought we'd just go through a Q&A just again to honestly, I want you to help educate me and the listener just a little bit about what you know of football vintage. I know baseball is your wheelhouse, but just the fact that you have a great background of vintage card collecting, I thought we would uh, pick your brain. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So then, I mean, obviously you're a much younger guy uh, at your age. What got you into vintage collecting? Because I think the narrative sometimes is that the older crowd is the people that appreciate vintage the most. Yeah, no, I got into vintage because my dad, he owned a card shop in the 90s ended up closing it down got in the hobby once again when i was born but always preached you know there's so there's millions of brand new cards they're only going to print out so many old cards on top of that the preservation wasn't there in comparison to new cards new cards literally goes straight from a box now to a penny sleeve and into a top loader i mean if you don't get an eight nine or a ten on that 
I don't know what to say. I mean, obviously there's yeah. some manufacturing issues, but most of them are already ready to get graded high end grades. Now, if you look in the past, whether it's pre-war or vintage 50s through 70s, you don't have that case. People didn't have the supplies all available to them. And that's why you don't see as many eights, nines and tens. And that's why for those players and certain key rookie cards, there's a premium based around this. Right. Definitely. I think so. I mean, can I say that you like it because of scarcity a lot? The scarcity yeah. is a big well, pull. Yeah. Scarcity. And it's a little bit more of a conservative investment or standpoint of like collecting rather than a lot of the new new players because there's always someone new to chase after, but the opportunity for them to become a top 10 player or top 20 is very, very slim. And people put way too much money into new players expecting them to be the greatest of all time or <laughs> yeah. top 10 player, yet you can buy that top 10 player often cheaper in a high grade. So at what point is your trade-off, whether you want to buy someone that's already – one of your best football players of all time. So when people are going to remember 40, 50 years from now, or a, I know a bit football's not really prospect, but rookies that are kind of unproven yet just coming straight out of college, maybe they had a great year. Maybe they might've won a Heisman trophy, but are we really going to put all that money towards that player versus when you have an established player to go after? Yeah, it is. It is amazing to see, even I'm an Oregon fan and Justin Herbert's rookie cards go for a pretty penny. And you think about the kind of vintage you can buy with that penny is kind of hard to fathom when you see the pop reports of some of the Justin Herbert prisms, even though, like I said, I'm a fan. I think he's a great player, but he's no, you know, Jerry Rice or no. any of those type of guys. So definitely. There's still, there's still so many Jerry Rice cards too. Yeah. A lot less than Herbert's and yeah. Rice is widely considered the best wide receiver of all time. Definitely. Definitely. So obviously I think you're probably definitely a unique person of how you're into vintage. You I mean, having that kind of background with your dad, that's an awesome story. Um, I think question sometimes is, is how does vintage sustain when the people that are main part of the hobby aren't aware of who Willie Mays is or Jim Brown is or the older players? How does vintage still survive when the like not really knowing much about the player is an issue in your mind? I think over time, people start researching and figuring out where vintage is. I mean, no one goes straight from buying modern cards to vintage. If you go, if you come into the hobby, you're not going to go out there and buy pre-war cards. You're going to go out there and buy what everyone else is buying. You're going to buy a brand new box. Let's say you find a 2021, whether it's like a prism box, optic, or whatever football box is out there, and you're going to buy that and open up and find all those players. But over time, uh, some people start getting bored of modern products and start going back. We already see a lot of people now going towards the 90s inserts. Well, what happened? Yeah. And get bored with the 90 inserts. Oh, let's check out the 80s. Oh, let's yeah. check out the 70s. Let's check out the 60s. And just yeah. the progression of going from modern all the way to vintage. And as people, like I said, become more familiar with the hobby, they get more experience. They're going to start slowly picking up the names when people make some comparisons like, oh, Herbert is a great quarterback, but how does he compare to a Bart Starr or a Johnny Unitas or any other vintage quarterback? And there's discussions that are made from that. And they might hear that name, Bart Starr. Oh, who's Bart Starr? Look it up. Oh, Green Bay Packers, really, really good. Oh, who's Unitas? Oh, with the Colts. Oh, he's a great quarterback as well. <laughs> you know, start falling into that rabbit hole and yep. start at the vintage side of things because I think that's eventually going to happen with a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, it kind of happened with me a little bit. I mean, being born in 85, um, I was a big Cowboys. I'm a big Cowboys fan, so obviously Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, and all those guys. I was a huge Peyton Manning fan just watching him, just seeing how he played the game. So, like, I kind of got into those 90s inserts you're talking about, like those 95, those flair rookies of Peyton Manning I really got into. Um, I do want to go back because, you know, I also have connections to, like, playing Techno Bowl when I was young and playing with Walter Payton. Like, those things still matter. Those things still kind of uh, resonate with me. So I definitely will be working my way backwards as well. So I think it's kind of cool that you kind of mentioned that. Um, in your mind, like what defines, like what year defines like a vintage card? Cause like I said, I don't, we can probably agree that like probably Jerry Rice, no, Barry Sanders, no, Troy Aikman, no, these are all eighties, um, cards. Like in your mind, where does that vintage line ish kind of sit? I know a lot of collectors either say it's 75 or 79, at least on the baseball side for 75, just because the 75s were kind of like a vintage design with how the colors pop. And then 76 through 79, their designs are eh, in comparison. Okay. But I know a lot of people have a hard deadline of 1979 and older is vintage. But I mean, as there's more and more cards, I mean, even if you think about it, 1980 is 41 years. I mean, yeah. at, at a certain point, you can't not consider it vintage, but there has to be some name towards it. Because 1980, it's not fully junk wax as well. So I think we're going to see more names pop off 
like 80s, mid 80s and different things like that over time. Yeah. Well, because I mean, honestly, when you look at the 1990 score set versus the cards now, I mean, that looks vintage to me, you know, like the portrait, the green borders. I mean, that's not happening anymore. So right. I know 90s is not close to vintage, yeah. but it just I think you're right. It's going to work that way eventually. Uh, definitely. That's cool. So they but, kind of uh, almost pre pre 80. Yeah. I was going to say it's funny, though, because you hear a lot of newer collectors that say the Tom Brady rookie card is vintage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, a 2000 card being vintage now we're feeling old at least i am <laughs> um so like in modern cards many are trying to find like the next big thing like you said earlier in the show they're trying to find that player ascending or you know trout or tom brady who's playing now at an all-time high i just wondered from a vintage collecting standpoint is there ever like hidden gems that you look for or just guys that are maybe overlooked within the hobby that um you can find good deals on or just that are under, like that have a chance to grow in value or is vintage pretty much kind of just straight kind of guys can stay in their spot <laughs> Honestly, I look at a lot of the vintage quarterbacks are just way undervalued compared to, some, to the modern guys. I mean, just look how much Herbert's going for. Or look how much of Mahomes is going for. Yet you can find a lot of the greats in the 50s through 70s dirt cheap in comparison. Yeah. I mean, even like Joe Montana's rookie cards, not even close to those guys, which is kind of ridiculous. No. Um, he's some, some consider him the best quarterback of all time before Tom Brady went on his run. So that's definitely something to consider. Cool. Um in terms of like vintage, talk to me about your kind of pre-war vintage and how that like plays into vintage. I know you know a lot about that and I, I don't, and I just want to learn. So what is your kind of, uh, what, what does the pre-war vintage mean besides pre-war? <laughs> so it's before World War II and a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of football cards uh, before and pre-war. Everyone knows about baseball being pre-war. Some people might know about boxing, but there's a rich football history and that goes back into the college days of football. So the first card was actually in Goodwin Champions in 1888. Wow. And the first actual full football set was, I think it's 18, it's in the 1890s. I want to say it's 1894. I can't remember the exact year because Mayo made it. They made a few different sets. They had a boxing set, which was exactly in 1890. They had a baseball set, which might have been 94. And then they also had the football set. Um, but they had about 30 or so different collegiate football players between Yale, Harvard, and Princeton in that set. And that's again 1890s. So, you know, those two sets all the way from the 1800s and then the early 1900s as well. You had the Sporting Kings from Gowdy, which has Newt Rockney. Then you had the National Jiggle set, which has the Bronco uh, rookie card. I think it's his rookie card, not fully sure, but it's one of the it, before the Tom Brady cards blew up. The Bronco was one of the most expensive cards in the hobby. I believe a high grade actually was the most expensive football card. I don't think there has been any recent sales of a high grade anytime recently but that was the go-to card for like vintage football or football in general for the longest amount of time 1935 bronco wow that's crazy that that's a long time ago yeah so football goes back a lot farther than probably most collectors realize yeah and it's really cool with it too i mean yeah. you're not you're, you're not going to have a lot of professional per se but you still have all the different college players and they're very very collectible for quite a few people yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's cool. Um, the other question I want to ask you, I mean, obviously we just talked about you've been to 50 card shows. I'm just wondering when you're walking around a card show, like how well do you know these vintage sets? I mean, you said, you know, you can say baseball or, or, and football, but when you're walking around or you kind of have to be like, Oh, which one is that? Or do you feel like you're pretty, you have them down pretty well knowing what sets or what, when it comes to each sport? I have them down pretty well. Football, sometimes I mess up on a few years just because I don't deal with it as much as baseball, but Larry baseball, seconds can pretty much name anything across the board pre-war i'm pretty good at some of the strip cards are kind of and because a lot of them kind of look similar and there's so many different abbreviations of them uh yeah. it's all, because it's, they're all numbered based mostly compared to said to like okay it's like oh tops and you know the exact year all of them are like the weird names on that side of things but it's it's pretty easy at this point yeah that's pretty cool that's a lot of sets to kind of know that's pretty impressive that's impressive Brian. um I guess actually one last question I was going to ask you is, do you have a favorite vintage football set? Favorite vintage football set, man. Um, if I, if I was going to buy some cards, it'd be the Mayo set. I just think they're really cool. Just be, it's the first football set ever produced. And I already have some of the Mayos for boxing, none of the baseball yet, but I just really like the design. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Cool. Well, I thought we'd just round this out, Ryan, by throwing up a couple of your uh, vintage cards um as we go through we have six cars to show the listeners today 
And as we go through them, even just kind of talk about how you got them. I'm going to talk about the pricing and like kind of the pop report so people kind of see the scarcity. Um, but I thought that would be a fun thing for us to do is kind of go through uh, what you brought for us. Yeah. So we'll, we'll start with – sorry, go ahead. I'll say all these cards are pretty much pickups, I think, within this year or so. I have a lot of football cards at PSA right now, so I can take pictures of those. But Awesome. Perfect. So the first one we got up is a 1961 Topps Paul Hornick. Not number 40. Uh, his raws are pretty affordable on 15. PSA 6 for 30. Only 464 graded with only 16 nines. So definitely a nine is a very rare card. Six to eight is the majority of the pop report with 320. Uh, so what do you like about this card? Or what made you pick this one up? I just thought it looks pretty nice overall. I mean, it's a 61, so it's pretty old in that side of things. And you can't go wrong with it. I know it's not his rookie card. I believe his rookie was in 57, so it's a few years later. But just presents extremely well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, being a Packer, like Packers were yep. the, you know, one of the better teams to be around those, those days. They still are, but. Yeah. With uh, Bart Starr, the first Super Bowl, and then he was with Notre Dame too. So we look at from college football perspective, played for one of the biggest schools, like a legacy on that side of things. And then also winning the first Super Bowl. So pretty yeah. good. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, card number two, I definitely like this one quite a bit. Uh, playing receiver in college myself, I'm definitely a receiver fan. Uh, so Steve Largent, I'm also from the Northwest. So um, Steve Largent, 1977, uh, what number 177, his rookie card, I believe, right? Yeah, that is his rookie card. Yeah, so those raw go for 6 to 20, PSA 9 for 526. So there's some value there people are chasing. PSA 7 for 70, that kind of sounds good to me, just get that in my collection. Uh, over 3,000 submitted, so pretty good chunk submitted for an older card. But you can see only 25 tens, definitely hard to gem. Yeah. 421 nines, so definitely a pretty cool card to have. So, what do you think about your Largent card? It's a little off center, but it, it was one of those the cards that presented well. I think I paid like five or ten dollars for it. So there's a lot of options out there if you go through like bargain bins or know your cards out there. And that's one of those type of cards you pay ten dollars for, you get it graded when PSA opens up again for like $30 or you just sent it to SGC. And that's one of those that have opportunity to make money on. Yeah, definitely. And even in just putting that card in a slab to preserve it long-term, you know, just get a little bit better, uh, better long-term condition. So it doesn't have to go through the spokes anymore. <laughs> yeah. <but that laughs> one, that. Arjun also is a great wide receiver too. Yeah. Very underappreciated. I think as a long, as like a career receiver, definitely. Um, we have 1957 tops. Why tittle? Number 30. So his raw goes for 10 to 26, PSA 6 for 55, PSA 9 for 96. Uh, really rare, like 641 submitted, only seven nines. It's kind of $96 yeah. for that. That seems like a bargain at a PSA 9 for 96. That's what I was thinking when I saw it. Because I mean, if there's only, if there's only uh, what I have, seven of them, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So somebody yeah. got to steal. But uh, tell me a little about this card. Another another great player. What I was talking about earlier with quarterbacks being undervalued. 1957 is a great year for quarterbacks. Now, this isn't uh, Tittle's rookie card. Uh, there's the Bart Starr rookie in the set. But still, like you, you can't go wrong with a card that presents extremely well, especially in the 1950s. I mean, looking at it, it was probably what, like a six or seven, just looking at it far away. Mm -hmm. I just think. To me, this card design is probably the best one that you sent me. I think kind of having the portrait next to like an action shot is pretty cool. Um, and then I think it's also pretty cool like looking at like – it says back, 49ers. Not running back, not quarterback. It just says back. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's pretty funny too. Uh, just kind of see like, like kind of older stuff. Awesome. Uh, all right. Next one, Larry Zonka rookie, 1969. So that goes for like 30 to 40. Uh, PSA 8305, PSA 7 127. So he's pretty valued within the hobby for his his graded. Probably playing on the Dolphins definitely helped. Yep, undefeated team. <laughs> yep, and so his pops around 2055, one PSA 10, 39 PSA 9. So definitely a def hard to card to gym. So yep. that PS PSA 8 is a pretty good deal as well for seeing that pop report. Uh, yep. What do you what do you think? Sorry, what do you think about the Zonk card? It's a, what are you doing? What's up? Uh, Oh, no, I thought you were saying something. No, I, I really like it because these cards are hard to find in really good shape. And when you see them at a show, uh, the 69s you grab them, it's kind of like the 63 tops for baseball or the 71s. They chip so easily, and uh, especially on the red with this Zonka. So I saw it in great shape, decided to pick it up. I mean, that does look in great shape for a raw card. Are you planning on subbing it? One day. Yeah, one day. That's awesome. Perfect. Slide five. We got a big one coming on slide six. Yep. Uh, 1950. So our oldest one you sent me, uh, 
Sammy Baugh, number 100. Uh, 95 raw, PSA 7, 305, PSA 8, 570. There's only 439 of these cards graded by PSA with four PSA 9s. So definitely a rare PSA 9 and even 70 PSA 8s quite rare as well. Um, with that, they're half the population being 6s and 7s. Uh, tell me about this card. What do you think about uh, your 1950 Bowman? Sammy Ba, really great quarterback. 1950 Bowman, the same exact design as baseball as well. So uh, I wanted to pick up a 1950 Bowman, saw the ball at a card show and grabbed it. I mean, I think it presented really well. I think it was probably a seven ish. Um, just remembering it, but yeah, can't go wrong with it. Yeah. That seven would be a great, great deal for you. That's good. It's a good, uh, good looking card. Uh, kind of funny. Those kind of cards that aren't the normal shape instantly. You're like, that's not the normal shape of a card. Like, oh. like the, no the normal size. So I like that a lot. It in 1957, the tops baseball cards. That's the first one they had. Kind of normal, and from there on, the hobby started going towards that because they were oversized in the 50s. And then before that, like with Bowman, they had different designs or different sizes for 50 and then 51 as well. So uh, it's just funny, it's been standardized for such a long time. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's a cool looking card. All right, and your big one here. So you have 1958 Tops Jim Brown rookie. You have a looks like a BGS five, yep. uh, five. raw. Yeah, <laughs> what's that? A BVG five, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, raw 685, PSA 3 1200, PSA 5 3000, PSA 6 4300. Uh, the pop on these, I actually had that pulled up, I just didn't put it in the slide. Let me just grab that real quick. Why don't you tell us, um, how you got this card? You have a pretty good story about how you acquired it, yeah. I mean, I got this card pretty much through wheeling and dealing at different card shows, so it has to, has to go all the way back into I think it was early January when the Tiger Woods cards exploded. So I was at a card show in Clearwater and I saw a nice Bob Gibson rookie card. It was a PSA four. And at the time Tiger Woods cards exploded, I was going through dollar boxes and bargain bins and I found two Tiger Woods cards across two different shows. One was like a, um, a KSA, the, it was like a Canadian grading company. It was like a 9.5 and then also a Rollin. So I traded both of those. I traded a Carmen Electro refractor card. I found in a dollar box. And I think a hundred dollars and a Steph Curry prism, uh, which was like a PSA nine. It was like a red or something like that, which I found in a $20 box for this Bob Gibson. So I think I had like, it's like 150 or $160 into a Bob Gibson PSA four. And then I took the Gibson and I went to the Wisconsin Dells card show and I traded the Bob Gibson, a 1954 Ted Williams. It was the last card in the set PSA three, I believe a Jack Johnson 1948 leaf, which I had for the longest amount of time, couldn't have paid much for it and $800. And I got this Jim Brown. So in total, I was in $800 plus 180 for the one trade. So 980 plus, I think for that Ted Williams, I was in it, into it for about 200 or so. And then that Jack Johnson, probably 20 bucks. So $1,200 into this card. Wow. So 1200 into this card and you, about four extra money because you know this your one's probably right in the three to four range there so that's pretty awesome trade up man that's a good story uh jim brown's pop he's got 3700 submitted um only six nines 198 for eights and then he's got about i'd say 18 1800 that are fives and sevens kind of all together there so i mean for one of the best running backs of all time the kind of the he has a lot more than just playing the running back position very similar a lot of guys that kind of broke those barriers in terms of color and stuff. Jim Brown was definitely a part of that. Um, so his card's going to be worth a lot for a long time because for him, it's not just for football, even though he's really good at that. Correct. That's all. And the one thing that, that's good about this Jim Brown is it's pretty nicely centered. A lot of different, uh, a lot of the value on the card is the centering and eye appeal on it, especially in the mid tier grades, because you can't always uh, predict or promise that every card is going to get a, let's say a four through six can be nicely centered. And you can see this one, it's slightly off center, but like from a distance, it, it looks really, really good compared to other ones because a lot of them are almost all the way over in the border. And yeah, really, oh, yeah. that's why a lot of these prices for the grades also fluctuate quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, definitely your left to right does not look bad at all. I mean, you can see a little bit top to bottom. Oh, that right. might be a little bit of the picture, um, but definitely, definitely good card. And I did notice as well on a lot of the, um, like when I was looking at sales and stuff, a lot of the sales are like great centering. You can tell people are selling the centering for the Jim Brown as well. <laughs> yeah. 
though with, with that year because it's the center is so bad on them. You're right. Well, you get those white borders with the color background like that and the circle in the middle that definitely kind of throw oh. off the per perception for sure. Well, perfect, Ryan. Well, I really appreciate you joining me and just going through all that vintage stuff with us. That was awesome. Um, before we get out of here, I just wanted to ask you one question before I put you on the spot. Who's winning the Super Bowl this year? I hope the Bucks, because I'm from Florida. I grew yeah. up in Dallas, so. Yeah, I mean, right now they're kind of the, the chalk, I'd say. They hit the best quarterback in the game, and they got pretty young guys, young guys around them to make it happen. So, Absolutely. all right, well, we'll check back in. Great, good, you know, good luck with your book. Uh, an awesome job getting the 52 card shows on the way here for the year's over. So congrats on that and uh, take care. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me on as well. Bye. Yeah.